You've acquired the trabectome technology, and soon you will be performing your first trabectome surgery, joining thousands of physicians worldwide who are doing this elegant procedure. Now, the idea behind trabectome is simple in concept. You make a clear cornea incision, move across the iris to ablate somewhere between 60 to 120 degrees of trabecular meshwork, opening Schlimm's canal, thus gaining better access to the collector channels and lowering ILP. While the concept is simple, there is a learning curve. In this brief presentation, we'll focus on three basic fundamentals. The proper use and the importance of practice with the gonial lens, the position of both the microscope and the patient's head in relationship to the surgeon, and the accurate identification of the trabecular meshwork through a simple technique of burping the clear cornea incision. I think the key early on is getting positioning down. It's amazing how much further you have to rotate the head away from you and tilt the scope away from the patient than you would imagine. So I believe getting the positioning down, the view down early, even before attempting your first trabectome is key. Before you even start doing your first procedure, I would advocate practicing going through the motions. Hold the gonial lens on the cornea without indenting the cornea. It'll help getting used to having two, using two hands so that you're holding the gonial lens with one hand and inserting an instrument across the anterior chamber into the opposite angle with the other and making sure that you're able to keep your view. If you can eliminate some of those factors, it will significantly reduce your stress the day that you're actually doing the surgery. Paying attention to details is always the name of the game in our field. You want to use high magnification so that you can really see the anatomy. The problem with high magnification is that you lose depth of field and so you'll very easily go out of focus. So what I'll typically do is advocate going high magnification initially to see the tip penetrate into Schlem's canal. And once I'm sure I'm there, then I'll zoom out a little bit so my depth of field increases as I'm moving uh, you know, across. In the beginning, I would recommend making a standard linear incision. I wouldn't get fancy. Once you have some experience, I would advocate flaring the inner lip of the incision That'll allow you to get a wider treatment arc, and I do believe that you can achieve lower pressures with a wider treatment arc. For a surgeon who has no experience with angle surgery, it's a completely different feel, and that's why I really advocate taking the time, even you know, two, three months before you do your first case, to start practicing going through all those motions. Uh, it'll make a huge difference. I start with the patient's head position. So I sit temporally to the patient, depending on which eye the patient is having surgery on, and I will have the microscope tilted towards me, and then I will make sure that my oculars are in good position, and then I will take the patient's head and I will turn it away from me. All right, Dr. JK here. We're going to get started. I'm going to be turning your head to the side. Go ahead and follow my lead. As I turn the patient's head away from me, and I will put some uh, viscoelastic on the surface of the eye, on the cornea, and then I'll take my gonial lens to see that I, I have a good view. If I do not have a good adequate view where it allows me to see the trabecular meshwork very well, then I will turn the patient's head even more in order to get a good view. All right, I'm going to be turning your head over to the side a bit more. It is essential to have a very good view of the angle before you even begin the surgery. After that is attained, then I would take my surgical blade, it has a 1.8 millimeter width. I use a Wexel sponge cut flush, so it's good to use something that will help stabilize the eye as uh, you make a corneal incision in order to make a wound temporally. That corneal incision that I make is typically one that is near the limbus and is a straight and fairly long incision into the anterior chamber. Then after that's performed, I take a cannula that has my anesthetic, which is sugar cane. I insert that medication into the eye in order to anesthetize the eye. 
Then right before I actually insert that medication, I do take the tip of the cannula and I depress the wound. And I do this in order to draw out some of the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber. And what this allows me to do is to basically uh, hypotenize the eye and so that there is a level of egress of heme that comes through into the trabecular meshwork. This allows for visualization of the trabecular meshwork, especially in patients who have very minimally pigmented trabecular meshwork. The first and important thing I think for you as a beginner is get a great microscope for your first case. If you have access to a Lumera, for instance, with nice xenon light that gives you a good color contrast, that is what you want to use for that. Or any good microscope that has also a good tilt. If you start out with an average scope that has sort of a shift tilt where the thing plops towards you that you cannot adjust gradually, or any microscope with terrible optics, don't use it. The second mistake that beginners make is, of course you want to have a form chamber, so you're bam, inject a bunch of viscoelastic in the AC. Don't do that. It traps bubbles. Induce low pressure in the eye. You want to see where the meshwork is. You gape the wound. You want to see flow back in the canal. Where you see red, that's where the canal is. Don't go after the ciliary band. <laughs> I have a video where an experienced seasoned cataract surgeon of 30 years, fabulous anterior segment surgeon, goes in with confidence and boom, creates a big bleeding because he did blades and he ablates and he ablates in the mesh in the uh, ciliary band. You should, I make a description before the surgery. Uh, you know the it's like the pupil, the iris, and the yeah. trabecular meshwork, right? Yeah. And I write how much pigment. For example, this one is questionable. I'm not sure if there is pigment or there's no pigment and it looks like pigment. Okay. So when I'm not sure, I would write to do hypotony. So I create hypotony in the eye so mm -hmm. that I have blood coming to the trabecular mesh okay. Schlimm's canal, and then I know exactly where it is. Each case I prepare so that I know it's not a surprise because a slit lamp you see better than here, always. So I like to you first prepare with a slit lamp, mm -hmm. and then here I know what I'm dealing with. It makes it easier so you do the right thing and not in the wrong place. I, I think actually this procedure is deceivingly simple. You look at this, you look at the video, instructional videos, it kind of feels very easy, very quick, so you do it and you don't get the best results. And I was surprised that after doing maybe 30, 40 trabectomes, I kind of sat back and I said, finally, I think I get it. Even though it seems simple, there is a learning curve that we don't maybe realize there is, and it just takes more experience because only with time are you going to really feel what you're doing. It's not only uh, visual, but it's also tactile. You actually begin to feel what you're doing. When is the angle of the needle of the trabectome is not just right? Uh, when does it not sit well with the uh, Schlems canal? Uh, how to lift the anterior, the TM itself, uh, forward towards you? And before you do the cutting, how well you can obliterate that internal wall. Uh, so there are so many factors that it, even when we are uh, experienced surgeons, it takes a while to really get it. So I would certainly not claim or feel, hey, it just doesn't work. I would do more and learn to do it better, and you would be surprised. Again, this is a very effective treatment that can help me control their glaucoma better. Keeping these fundamentals in mind will serve you well as you begin your journey with trabectome. However, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you.